Microsoft is on acid, crowdfunding for Twitter, Andromeda is coming, and a new California law that lets you lie about your age. All that and a whole lot more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1606, recorded Monday, September 26th, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by LinkedIn Learning. Develop talent and keep skills current with expert-led on-demand e-learning. To request a demo for your organization or get a free individual trial, visit learning.linkedin.com slash twit. And by Gazelle, the online marketplace for buying and selling used gadgets. Shop from a variety of certified pre-owned electronics or trade one in for cash. Give a new life to a used device, visit gazelle.com today. And by ZipRecruiter, are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to more than 100 job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about all the tech news that matters. And we are the Lester Holt and Martha Raditz of Tech News. Who, who are they? <laughs> Debate moderators. Oh, See, okay, in the pre-show, we were talking about how we should not do election coverage, right. uh, you know, for any of the networks, and I think I proved why. Do you want to be Martha Raditz or sure. Lester Holt? Mar yeah, okay, I'll, I'll be Martha. Okay, good. <laughs> that works for me. I'll be Lester then. All right, excellent. Let's start. All right. Microsoft Ignite starts today, and so far the company announced a partnership with Adobe, more AI-powered features in Office 365, and some upgrades to Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection, including new ways to isolate the Edge browser from attacks. Now, they really want people to believe that Windows 10 is the safest, most secure place to work. Microsoft Corporate VP Joseph Soroche also said, ACID is changing the face of computing. What is ACID? <laughs> Microsoft is on ACID. ACID. It's not what I think it is, is it? It's, it's not, okay. not a, not, it, ACID okay. stands probably not for what you think it is. <laughs> it stands for Algorithms, Cloud, IoT, and Data. Okay. So That's not, exactly what I thought it stood not, for. Not the fun kind of ACID at okay. all. Okay. All right. <laughs> they also said Windows 10 uh, is active on 400 million devices. That's up from 300 million in May. That's a far cry from, what was it, a billion by 2018? But, well, I mean, I guess if they continue there, then maybe they end the year with 500 million. They're halfway there. They're, They've got yeah, a whole year to get there, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. So. But it's probably easier to come out of the gate and get a large number mm -hmm. than it is to make up organically that number uh, through the next year. Well, it's not free anymore, so Well, that. yeah, there's that too. <laughs> that's a that's a big, um, big asterisk. Uh, Microsoft also says its goal is to democratize AI, which uh, we have Stephen Levy on a little bit later in the show to talk about this very concept. So I'll be very curious to hear kind of what he thinks about Microsoft's strategy as far as that uh, is concerned. But they kind of threw out some jabs to the competition. They said their goal of their AI is to not beat humans at games. Mm -hmm. uh, but to empower people and organizations to kind of get in on the artificial intelligence uh, bandwagon. Their plan is to add that intelligence to more products, things like Office 365, Skype, and basically just use Cortana as the agent of all of these things across their platforms. I mean, which they've already kind of started doing. So mm -hmm. no, no big surprise there. Nope. Uh, the rumor that Chrome OS and Android would someday merge is a drumbeat that we've heard for literally years now. And some may have thought that Google's move to bring Android apps into Chrome OS, which was announced at this year's Google I.O., was the end game for those rumors. But it turns out that's only the beginning according to numerous sources to Android Police as well as to 9to5Google. Uh, with a high level of confidence, both outlets are saying to expect a new Chromebook Pixel in Q3 of 2017. So not this year, but that's not the most interesting part. It's going to be running something called Andromeda, which is basically, uh, if this, this is to be believed, which they both feel very highly that, that their sources are accurate, uh, a combined Android and Chrome OS Wall Street Journal hinted at this year, uh, a year ago, actually, as of this, as of October, uh, based on its own sources. That was obviously a year earlier, so earlier in the stages. They said 2016 would be the year the public would see 
how this works, and 2017 would be the year that it hits people's hands. So do you think we might see a little something about Andromeda at the October event, maybe, perhaps? I don't know. I mean, I hope so. That's next week. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. That would be a lot to announce. Like, you know, the, the, there's the new phones made by Google. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be the big announcement. And Home is going to, hopefully Google Home is going to be there too. So yeah. 4K know. Chromecast. I mean, they've got a lot on the docket. We had heard... Uh, rumors about a Huawei tablet. Sources are telling nine to five Google that the Huawei tablet would be uh, would be Nexus, would not be Pixel. So that would mean that the Nexus branding would not go away if this is to be believed, and that it would be kind of the introductory piece of hardware to show off Andromeda. Now Andromeda. From what we're hearing here, it's an ultra-thin laptop that Google is working to be, or not Andromeda, sorry, the, the Pixel, which they're calling Bison, running Andromeda, would be this ultra-thin uh, portable laptop that would kind of showcase you know, the best of both worlds, essentially, and would be meant to challenge Apple and Microsoft and laptop space, kind of targeting like the MacBook Pro line of of devices. The iPad Pro or the MacBook Pro? The MacBook Pro. Oh. Um, so it's meant to be, so basically what it sounds like is Google's preparing to make their own like, kind of, you know, to answer the calls of people that are like, yeah, but Chrome OS, you know, it's just the cloud and, and it's not a high performance, high power thing. You know, it's got its limitations. It sounds like what Google wants to do is they want to make a new OS that addresses those concerns and gives you a Google version of the MacBook Pro. Mm -hmm. And so it, presumably it would have a keyboard. Yeah. And would it, do you think it would be like a detachable or? I don't know. I don't think that they, the, the sources alluded to whether it was going to be a detachable or a kind of like a two-in-one or hybrid, that's what I'm guessing, mm -hmm. is that would be something, and I mean, mind you, we don't actually know, but I'm guessing if it's part of the Pixel brand, if it's actually truly going to be the next Pixel in the lineup, then it would still follow the format of the Pixel uh, form factor, but that maybe it would convert into tablet mode, which is kind of something that's really nice about what you get with the Chrome OS right now that's running Android apps. That's a feature that I think that they would want to make sure. And it would also have uh, stylus support, Wacom, Wacom stylus support. Um, yeah, I'm very, very curious to see if they show off some of this stuff at, in October 4th. I could see them like presenting the tablet and being like, this is a Nexus. Nexus is designed for developers to help lift up our, our efforts. So here you go, here this is, maybe it doesn't launch necessarily to developers with Andromeda right out of the gate, but maybe it's the first device, it's kind of like the intro device to get developers' minds and uh, their efforts kind of in line with the new direction. That's interesting, because I misread this. I thought they were trying to compare it to the iPad Pro, and it, they said the price was about $800, and I was like, well, that's interesting, because that's about the same price as an iPad Pro, but um, yeah, targeting MacBook Pro users, definitely $800 sounds good compared to a MacBook Pro. I mean, that's a pretty, yeah, that's a pretty low cost uh, yeah. in comparison with a MacBook Pro for sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, if they were to come out with a laptop that was fifteen hundred two grand, I don't know. Well, I guess they did that with the Pixel 1. It was like yeah. $1,500 when it launched, and it was only running Chrome OS. Right, so. and it wasn't for the average was, person, right? Mm, I mean, that the mm. first Pixel was really for... I mean, that's like, what I'm using right now. This is the Pixel, and I mean, it's as much for the average person as a Chrome OS laptop is. It's just, it's more, yeah, it's it's not in the sense that it was a little bit more premium. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, a lot more premium compared to a lot of the comparable uh, uh, Chrome OS laptops. So, mm -hmm. Well, late... Friday night, Snapchat unveiled their rumored glasses. They're called uh, Snap Spectacles. I think they're just called Spectacles. They'll cost $130. They'll record video from the wearer's perspective, and they will be available this fall. Now, this is the company's first piece of hardware. Also comes with a name change. They're now calling themselves Snap Inc. instead of Snapchat, because obviously they're moving beyond the chat space. It has a 115 degree lens, It'll record 10 seconds of video every time you tap it, so you tap it again in more than 10 seconds. Uh, and it's more of what the eye sees, apparently. Uh, Evan Spiegel, the CEO of, Sna of Snap, says square video is a remnant of printing photos on paper. Um, so that's why they're not going with the square anymore. I thought also it's like It's gonna be the video, circular video. Yeah, but video was also like 
that's square TVs were square shaped, movie yeah. theaters were that shape. But apparently now we're going to see video as what the eye sees. Yes, but okay. So a, a couple of really interesting parts about this. First of all, I, I'm strangely like excited for this, and I don't know why because I have Google Glass. I did the whole Google Glass thing. I thought the most compelling thing about Google Glass for me was what Evan was talking about in the Wall Street Journal that you've got a camera above your eye that records not video but records experience it records your memory essentially mm -hmm. like if you if i you know and i did this a number of times including my my younger daughter's first first steps as a as a baby um when i go back and watch that video i'm not seeing video shot from a phone where i was like in the middle of this phone looking at a display watching reality happen you know with this like invisible wall here i'm seeing what i remember seeing with my eyes because the camera was taken out of the equation it was always shooting in that direction i think that's what evan's talking about here the camera is positioned so close to the eye that you're not using a device to record something you're just capturing a memory you're being like this is a really cool scenario it does the thing you look where you're going to look and then you watch it later and you're like man i remember being there uh, so that's really cool. And then the recording in circular video, which what does that allow for? That allows you to get rid of the whole portrait landscape uh, conundrum mm -hmm. because basically what it does in the player and they kind of they showed this off in I think in an Instagram post or uh, something. But basically, no matter how it's positioned, the video is always staying upright and you're just moving the viewer that you see into that circular window so you never see the edges or anything like that it's always showing you what you want to see no matter what your orientation is uh i, I think that's really smart yeah i i am with you on the yes um let's not have phones in front of our face while yeah. we're like at the recital or you know at the wedding or anything um like that but I don't know if the solution is to let's have glasses on our face with yeah. a creepy camera inside of them. I mean, maybe the solution is like, let's just live our lives and not feel like we oh, need to record every moment. This is the internet. This is, and beyond that, this is Snapchat. So this is people that part of living their lives is recording their lives. I mean, that's just kind of at the core of it. Not to mention, it doesn't have to be. Like, well, we don't have to encourage this. You do if, snap, if you're a Snapchat and you want people to use your stuff. Yes, exactly. But I'm the voice of yeah, like, no, thank you. you, Snapchat. People need to see each other's eyes. I mean, that's oh. part of why Google Glass was so, uh, was part is part of the failure of Google Glass. People don't like communicating with other people when they can't see their eyes. Like it's just a human, it's built into us. It's how we relate to people. And I think that, um, you know, at least when you're like this, you can still see someone's yeah. eyes. So. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess I I have to accept that this is probably going to be popular uh, or or not. But I, I don't I don't want one among a, among a certain group is going to be. Would I would I buy these? Probably not. They're styled super young, right? Yeah. So you look at them and they look like something you buy out of the back of like a comic book or something like that. Uh, for one hundred thirty dollars, they're kind of within that. Eh, yeah, why not? You know, kind of disposable income mm -hmm. sort of area, but still for the tar for the demographic that it's targeting, that still might be too much for them, um, you know, without saving up. However, what they did here is really smart. They're allowing these glasses uh, to be playful like the services. So the younger users are going to, I, I imagine, are going to at least enjoy that or respect that, understand that this is the signature of Snapchat and that's why you do that. And then beyond that, they allow the, the camera on the glasses to record video in a way that you can't get through the app. So what does that tell other users? When you've got the glasses and you're using them to record stuff, when they look at it on their phone, they go, oh, this is a different type of video. It was obviously recorded with those glasses. That's really cool. I want them. And I think it's really smart. Like yeah. it, it, they learned a lot from Google, Gla from Google, uh, Google's kind of failure around Google Glass. And they kind of, I don't know, I think they made some good changes here. Am I going to get them? Probably not. Or maybe I will just to like play around with them and see what they're all about. But I think it's very interesting. Yes. Uh, Roku unveiled a refresh of its streaming media hardware today. You've got a few things here. Roku Express is replacing the Roku One. It's 75% smaller, twice as powerful. It's also capable of HD streaming. That's coming in at $30. So that's your no-brainer, you know, set-top box sort of thing. $40 uh, with included composite case cables if you need those. The Premier replaces the Roku Two. It has a quad-core processor, 4K with 60 frame per second support, and an IR remote, kind of a basic remote for $80. There's the Premier Plus that includes uh, all of that plus HDR capability and swaps the standard remote out for an enhanced remote 
that does include the headphone jack for quiet listening that I really want really bad because there are so many times that I would use that, but I don't have Roku, so uh, maybe I'll have to get one. That runs $100. And then there's the Ultra, which replaces the Roku 4, uh, which takes all the features that <laughs> everything you've heard and more. Uh, it includes an even awesomer remote and USB port for plugging media directly into the box, maybe your media collection, you know, on a removable media device. And that's uh, $130. And uh, I guess all of the models except for Express get a night listening mode, which is compression basically of audio. So it'll make your explosions quieter and your dialogue louder. So it kind of equalizes things uh, for late at night listening. Another feature I would love to have actually. Yeah, I have a, a Roku. It's a couple years old now. It's fine. I use it for um, Amazon because I can't get Amazon on my Apple TV. Um, there's a hundred streaming channels now. One of the things that they promote is it's unbiased search, which they're clearly like getting at uh, Google and you know Apple TV and you know the mm -hmm. Amazon, the Fire Stick or the Fire TV because you know they they want to keep you know, they have skin in the game, right? Where mm -hmm. Roku isn't uh, in bed with any of these other companies. You know, they don't have their own stuff that they're trying to sell, their own entertainment. So I can see why you'd want to use a Roku. Um, but it definitely feels like it is holiday shopping time. Like they're like, let's throw all of these, For everything sure. at the wall, see what sticks, see who buys what. And yeah. I mean, Roku's doing pretty, pretty well. Um, I think game consoles kind of lead the pack as far as uh, kind of video streaming on on the big screen. I know that's the case with me. Um, I have, we have the PS3 at home, but you know, Roku, I, I regularly hear about the Roku devices. That's probably because they're priced so well and uh, feature rich. So mm -hmm. yeah, go. I mean, they're slightly above the Chromecast, mm -hmm. but then they right. include the remote and yep. other things like that. So for sure. Yeah. If the idea of running your own NAS server out of your house always seemed like a little too much work, then you're in luck. Today, the popular media server service Plex announced a deal with Amazon to offer a hardware-free media server. You'll need a subscription to Amazon Drive, which costs $60 a year for unlimited storage. And you'll need a Plex Pass, that's $5 a month or $40 a year. And uh, you will no longer need an always on PC or a NAS at home to access your media from anywhere on any device. So this is great if you have a huge media library. Um, I do not. I just I'm happy with what Netflix can give me. I, ne I did. I never amassed my own media. I'm I'm good to share. But if you have your own media, your own stuff that you want to keep, and you want to look at on on your your devices when you're remote, this might be a good solution for you. Yeah, if you've got a large, uh, let's say DVD or Blu-ray collection, and you and you rip those and want to store them. Great. That's kind of what the, you know, part of what this is targeting. It's nice to offload the kind of the setup and the server and all that kind of stuff that can complicate the whole things. But you should know, I mean, if you're, even if you're doing this legitimately, and I'm sure a lot of people, you know, many users that are using Plex are using uh, illegitimate uh, files that they found online, let's say, of movies, TV shows, that sort of stuff. You're putting all of this stuff into Amazon's cloud. And from, from everything that I could tell, it's un, uh, unencrypted. So Amazon absolutely has the right to see this, to run fingerprints on the, the media that's up there. Even if you've ripped it, let's say, legitimately for your own use, they can still target that media because they, I mean, it's their servers, essentially. And uh, if it's unencrypted, it's unprotected, it's open to DMCA uh, violations. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. That's the trick with, I think, moving this sort of stuff into the cloud. You don't really know what's on the other end. Even if you're doing things on the up and up, you still could kind of be targeted uh, based on those scans. So, Up next, uh, Stephen Levy joins us to discuss how the proliferation of AI might not be so bad for jobs. We talk about how robots are taking our jobs. Maybe that's not the case. But first, let's take a minute to thank LinkedIn Learning. They're the sponsor of this episode. The shelf life of skills is less than five years, and many of today's fastest growing categories did not even exist five years ago. It's kind of a crazy world we live in. Uh, introducing LinkedIn Learning. It's personalized, expert-led, on-demand e-learning from LinkedIn. You can keep your team engaged. LinkedIn Learning is perfect uh, for promoting professional development, for giving it to your team and giving them the information and knowledge that they need to be better at what they do. LinkedIn Learning will identify the precise skills that you or your organization needs to achieve to set goals. Uh, it will create personalized recommendations using LinkedIn network intelligence. Your team is going to have access to more than 9,000 courses and more than 25 courses are added every single week. 
They have a huge library. The library includes courses taught by world-class industry experts, covering topics ranging from leadership skills to design principles, programming, all across the board. Learn anytime, anywhere with their bite-sized segments. So you can just kind of pick it up, drop in, learn something new, and move along. Uh, that can be viewed on any device, online or offline. Uh, those bite-sized videos provide immediate problem solving and can be downloaded uh, to learn on the go as well. It's the perfect way to help team members close a skills gap without interrupting your latest project. It's going to keep you more efficient, more productive. Team solutions are available for as little as $2,000. Grow your network and your career. Visit learning.linkedin.com slash twit to request a demo for your organization or get a free individual trial. That's learning.linkedin.com slash twit. And we thank LinkedIn Learning for their support of Tech News Today. If you listen to the tech news fear mongers like us, we've by now convinced you that <laughs> robots are going to steal all the jobs and the only ones left will be for geniuses with PhDs in machine learning. Our guest today suggests that the future is not that dismal and that designing AI might be as accessible as software coding has become today. Welcome Stephen Levy from Back Channel. Thank you. So you profiled a startup called Bonsai that hopes that AI is now in the assembly language era, which makes it easier for scientists to uh, create neural nets. Can you explain what this means? Yeah, so uh, it's not good for all of us that it's in the assembly level era. Uh, if you look at the history of computing, uh, when it first started, people had to write directly to the hardware. You really had to understand down to the digits how to program a computer. Uh, now we've moved to the assembly level era because places like, places like Google have come up with their toolkits like TensorFlow, which enable people who really know what they're doing to do things more efficiently. But the average programmer, the average software developer really can't develop a neural network on his or her own to uh, to train it and learn things like uh, how to understand language or things like that. Um, uh, and what this company Bonsai does is saying, okay, we're gonna take it to the next step, uh, the step where they did compilers so people can write in more uh, easy to write uh, code, higher level languages like C++ or Python or things like that, that kind of equivalent. So they have a scripting language called Inkling that people can use and you just write your program uh, you know, putting the concepts that you want to uh, have in the uh, whatever application you're writing. And in the background, this thing will build a neural network for you. So you could be uh, a machine learning power without having to take any training in how to use machine learning and, and build neural nets. So you sh uh, saw the demo at O'Reilly's Artificial Intelligence Conference and they showed off um, Bonsai playing the game Breakout. Why, right. why do they always train AI to play <laughs> games? Why do they do that? Well, games it turns out to be a good testing ground, a good proxy for more serious problems there. So it's no accident that DeepMind uh, in trying to make some advances in general artificial intelligence, trying to build a system that uh, can understand not just one thing, but lots of things. Uh, you know, you train it on you know, one game and it can learn how to play another game. They use the Atari game set to do that. So they trained it to play one Atari game and it learned a whole bunch of others, including Breakout. Um, didn't master Pac-Man, that was too tough for it. But, uh, <laughs> but, the, but the deep mind thing was very impressive because it was an exercise in general general artificial intelligence. That's the thing that kind of scares people, that if you teach something uh, AI, you know, it, it learns how to do things and then learns more on its own. You know, and then just can, you know, the singularity kind of stuff happens after that. Uh, and that's what DeepMind is going in that direction. They don't want to create the singularity, but they want to have an artificial intelligence that you just set out in the world to start learning things. So uh, for instance, if you're doing a self-driving car, uh, you put it behind the wheel and it keeps learning. It can you know, watch people drive and learn on its own. And then maybe it could learn from there, you know, watching what people do on the side of the road, uh, how to go into this 7-Eleven you know, and go get a case of beer. So that, that, that'd be very handy. You wouldn't have to train it on that. But that's for things that PhDs do. What this bonsai company does is it takes the deep learning out of deep learning you, you know, and, and does it for you. And it's a step where 
it, what I call a democratization of AI. Bonsai is one of only a number of companies that are working on different schemes for different audiences to bring, give you the power of deep learning without having to take it at Stanford f for six years. So, okay, so you say, look, Ma, no PhDs. We're in that, we're headed right. towards that. Uh, if we don't need a PhD, what, what do we need? Well, for Bonsai, you need to be a good programmer uh, because you have to write the code that uh, the company will then uh, turn over to its neural nets and, and implement it there. And the neural nets will be optimized in the case of breakout for a high score. If you're doing language, it'll be optimized to you know, interpret language correctly uh, and, and, and things like that. Uh, there's another company I mentioned in the article called Bottlenose, and they want to replace the data scientist. So they want to teach analysts, not programmers, how to get the benefits of uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, without having to learn how to, how to do that there. And there's one other company that's uh, uh, demonstrating at the AI conference, uh, in, uh, Javits uh, today, uh, saying how to get everyone on Earth to be able to train neural nets there. So you can't get any broader than that. Yeah, exactly. So. Um these are all startups that you uh, talk to or that you that you uh, write about in this article. Is there room for startups or is this really at this point Google and Apple and Microsoft's game like AI is there, or is there still room for startups? Well, what's happening is when a startup starts to get traction, one of those companies you mentioned usually buys it there. So uh, they, they when a company start out, they don't say, yeah, our, our goal is to be bought up by Google or uh Yahoo or Facebook or whoever, you know, uh, probably not Yahoo, but uh, it'll be, you know, if one of those companies does it well, uh, you can imagine a Google buying it. You know, Google open sourced its own tools, and I wouldn't be surprised if Google was interested in seeing uh, a system where people would use Google style of AI to bring AI to their programs, even if the programmers uh, didn't know how to do it. So Satya Nadella at Ignite today uh, had proclaimed that Microsoft is dedicated to, I mean, exactly what we're talking about here, uh, democratizing uh, AI. What's what's in it for Microsoft to, to do that compared to, let's say, a startup such as this that's, that's doing it as a service? What are the differences there? Well, they all want developers to write on their platforms there. So, uh, you know, Microsoft is a company. Remember, Steve Ballmer used to get up and say, developers, developers, developers. He'd scream it out loud. <laughs> they really haven't gone away from that. Uh, they, they want people to write to the Microsoft system. And if they can help people, you know, make their uh, programs or applications more intelligent, more powerful, um, then that's something good for Microsoft. All they need now is a phone that people can write apps for. <laughs> Very true. So, Stephen, you've been covering uh, technology for many decades, and um, is <laughs> boy, that's a big chunk. That, that, was, that was a compliment. I, I, I think you can still count those decades on your hands. Yes. <laughs> uh, so. Has has artificial? I mean, artificial intelligence has been around. We've been talking about it for probably as long as you've been writing. Um, what's changed now? What's different now than it was? You know, say 20, 30 years ago. It works. That's the big <laughs> difference. Yeah. Uh, you know, the you know, artificial intelligence was the biggest overpromise and underdeliver uh, in technology. You know, for many many years in the nineteen fifties, uh, when Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy and, and, and others. Uh, started it, they said, well, within a few years, we'll have things as, as, as smart as a human being there. Uh, and we still can't imagine that almost uh, ha happening there. We have things now that are, uh, for certain tasks, much smarter than human beings, uh, not just in breakout, but in things like uh, just type, you know, being able to take a, a, a typed query and going over billions of pages and finding the answer to your query. People can't do that. Um, and with this breakthrough, specifically in neural nets and what's called deep learning, uh, as a combination of better algorithms to do it, more computing power, and especially a lot more data to feed into these models. Uh, finally, this stuff is you know becoming super effective in solving problems and doing things like driving cars. So uh, we've reached the point where the time is right for uh, artificial intelligence to do sufficient traction that people are terrified of it. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Stephen Levy has been writing about technology since 1981. He's at, at Stephen Levy on Twitter. He's currently the editor-in-chief at Back Channel. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you, you Stephen. Too.
All right, feedback. Scott writes, while I was intrigued about Allo, the lack of a desktop client makes it DOA for our circles. As mobile as I am, I do 80% of my messaging from a computer. Nothing beats a real keyboard. I agree. Uh, and this is not unusual for most of the people that I message as well. As a result, we are heavy Hangouts users, even for SMS. You say Allo, I say goodbye. Google needs to stop being so schizophrenic about messaging and just improve Hangouts, which is far closer uh, to ideal than any of these new alternatives. I always feel like that's always been the case with Hangouts. So close. But then they started kind of undoing some of the things that made it made it nice, like the integrated kind of uh, SMS into messaging, kind of collapsed message thread or whatever. Uh, so I don't know. I have a feeling it might be waiting a while for them to kind of backtrack and decide to dedicate themselves to Hangouts again. I have a good feeling that Allo is kind of their focus, and I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it seems like the mobile platform is their focus. I mean, that's where they can get the most amount of data from us, right? Yeah, but I mean, I agree. I use uh, Hangouts a lot in, a, in a, the desktop environment while I'm working during the day, and uh, once you get used to that, it's really hard to then be attached to your phone again, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when messages come through, it's just so much more convenient, so it's a hard one to undo. Mm-hmm. Well, Twitter, which is often called the least place, happiest place on earth, might get bought by Disney. Alex Wilhelm from Mattermark talks about what this could mean. But first, let's take a minute to thank Gazelle, the sponsor of this episode. Gazelle is the trusted online marketplace for buying and selling used electronics. You can trade your old device in for cash or buy a certified pre-owned one, or you can do both. For trade-ins, simply visit gazelle.com, find your device, and get an instant quote. You could use that money to get the new iPhone 7 or the new Galaxy Note 7. Shipping is free and payment is fast. If you're looking to buy a certified pre-owned device, Gazelle has a variety of iPhones, including the iPhone 6S the 6S Plus, iPads, and Samsung Galaxy phones to choose from. Each device is fully inspected, backed by a 30-day return policy, and sold without a carrier contract. So go to gazelle.com, see what your old device is worth, and check out the selections of certified pre-owned devices today. Gazelle also offers a 12-month warranty for cell phones and iPads powered by Assurant Solutions. Now that will cover water damage, cracked screens, hardware defects, and more. Help is available 24-7 to process claims and return your device ASAP. Don't miss out on getting the best value on certified pre-owned devices Devices are available in good and excellent conditions. Good condition shows some gentle signs of wear and tear, but offers consumers great prices on still great devices. All devices have been put through a rigorous 30-point inspection process, ensuring that they are in perfect working order. Devices are available for support by the major carriers, including AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Sprint. So give a new life to your used electronics. Trade in for cash or buy certified pre-owned. Visit gazelle.com today. All right, so we've had a weekend to dwell on the reality of Twitter finding a new home in the hands of an acquisition. Joining us to talk about some of the developments is Alex Wilhelm from Mattermark. How's it going, Alex? I'm, I'm very good. I'm actually wearing a Twit t-shirt today by accident. So <laughs> It was uh, meant to be. Well, yeah, this proves I wasn't really meant to be on television today or in the podcast. <laughs> uh, horrible. Um, but I never say no, so hi. Exactly. Hi. No, you don't look horrible. Any Anything up here is overshadowed by what you got right here. It's so uh, true. That's what it, uh, I can't tell if that's a chest hair joke or in my heart. <laughs> but I think it's a compliment. Anywho, <laughs> moving on to the matter at hand. Um, so, okay, first of all, what were your thoughts when you heard uh, late last week that Google, Salesforce, a bunch of others were interested uh, in a run for Twitter? Yeah, my first thought was about time. Uh, what I heard way back in the day was that if Twitter ever got below $30 a share, it was going to be in play, quote, quote, and that did not come to pass. We got down to, what, like 14 15 bucks a share, and no one was biting. So for the longest time, I was just confused how Twitter went from, you know, darling breakout star to single, you know, giant by itself to no one wants it. And as the price went down, it became more and more obvious that it was a very troubled uh, entity. But to see these bids kind of finally come out means that the value proposition that we, you and I and we've all thought existed is now more apparent to these large corporate players. And I'm curious more if they're playing against one another or they all just really want the asset in question itself. Right. So, okay. So today Bloomberg is reporting that uh, Disney is working with a financial advisor to kind of weigh options on a bid for Twitter. What what does Twitter bring to a content company like Disney, do you think? 
Well, that rumor is very confusing to me, but what Twitter does bring is a very large media platform, especially for video content delivery. So as you know, the NFL uh, is now showing some games on Twitter. They're doing some concerts, I believe, and it's been pretty well received because the implementation has been quite strong. I actually now watch more NFL than before because of those deals. So if you're Disney and you are a content company looking for ways to reach the cord cutting audience, Twitter could be a pretty decent way to go about it. But the question then becomes how far can they leverage buying Twitter as the sole provider without reducing um, its ability to draw content from other people if it's now purchased and part of the Disney empire. So it's kind of smart for Disney to think about it as a content delivery platform, but it can't be exclusive. And that undercuts the value you could probably drive by buying it as opposed to partnering with it. So it makes some sense from a content delivery perspective, but certainly not entirely. Sure. Yeah, I don't think it makes, it doesn't make sense to me that they would buy uh Twitter, that Disney would buy Twitter. I mean, but then I remember when uh, Disney and ABC like joined forces like that. And it was like, oh, how can Disney and ABC be the same company like that? Seems ridiculous. But, you know, it happens. I mean, conglomerate media conglomeration happens. It's never good for us, but it might happen. But I mean, there's a user base of 300 million people on Twitter. But what would Disney do with us? I mean, that we're, we're the yeah. What would they do with us? <laughs> what are you going to do with us? You can't have conglomeration without agglomeration. So I kind of understand the idea of creating more users to their, their platform, but I don't see how what we do on Twitter fits into the Disney ethos of, you know, a family-friendly entertainment for everyone. Uh, if you look through their earnings, and I did before this segment to prep a little bit, you know, they have a ton of money from cable, a ton of money from, like, theme parks. And then I'm trying to fit the political and socioeconomic commentary we see on Twitter into that, that mix or niche, and it doesn't seem to line up. I get video distro, but how important is that to the broader Twitter experience? And then really, is it worth the amount of money they have to pay just to have slightly better visibility on a platform that isn't growing? I just, I can't quite square it out. Though Disney can certainly afford the transaction. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not, you know, that's not enough of a reason to drop up to $30 billion on a money losing asset with Twitter. Seems like we're hearing from basically all of these marquee companies, you know, and I mean, Disney kind of came out of left field as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, you hear from the the, the standard ones, Google, Facebook's not interested, apparently. We just heard or actually is being reported today that Microsoft is also interested. I mean, is part of like when a, when a, a company that has as much usage and as much of a kind of a, a particular kind of brand as Twitter does is rumored to be for sale, pretty much any big name technology company is going to at least kick the tires, right? And is part of that process seeking a financial advisor to kind of understand the financials behind it? Like, are we looking too much into every single company interested in Twitter? No, I don't think so. I think it's very, very important. I mean, and I think the historical echo we can lean upon to underscore that point is the LinkedIn deal. Because as it's now very well known, Salesforce was bidding against Microsoft to try to buy that asset. So we're seeing these large, wealthy tech companies have enough dollars to compete with one another for these companies that may not be great independent firms. And so when you see a company go as far as hiring a financial advisor, it shows real material interest, not right. intent. But I think you're right about the, the tire kicking thing. I mean, we can all listen to the reports, we can all read through the earnings, we can all look at the balance sheet, but that doesn't get you into the depths of how, there's a typo in that tweet, thanks guys. Uh, <laughs> excellent, excellent right there on the subtweet of the tweet during the show. I thought uh, that was a Twitter joke I didn't understand. I was like, no. oh, that must be some sort of thing like Harambe <laughs> that I don't understand. Um, no, that's just that's a mistake. Um, okay. that's uh, <laughs> the point there, uh, for people that missed the image, it showed Twitter's share price going up dramatically on the Disney acquisition rumor and the Disney share price going down dramatically on the rumor that it may buy Twitter. Right. Um, but, you know, turn it around. What would you guys pay for Twitter? It's worth about $20 billion today. What do you think a fair price would be? Uh, uh, what would I pay for Twitter? I mean, 25 I, Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to put a figure on that. That's a hard one. Yeah, nothing. That's what I'd pay for. <laughs> well, it does lose $100 million per quarter on a gap basis. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's in rough shape. What can you do? So why, why, why is Twitter down and, or sorry, Twitter up and Disney down on this news? I mean, apparently shareholders uh, of Disney are not fans of Twitter or do they think it's a liability? What do you think? They're probably not fans of the use of that much, that much equity and cash to buy the asset. I think Disney shareholders don't mind Twitter existing. I don't think they want to use uh, that much of their balance sheet to bring it into the family. I mean, the joke right. earlier about Twitter's continuing losses uh, is real and not real. It's real that it would be an impact that Disney would have to manage or at least uh, cut down on on the Twitter side of things. But Disney makes enough money on a quarterly basis and has a strong enough cash flow that it wouldn't really notice. 
the uh, the impact. But at the same time, Disney has a strong dividend flow. It has share buybacks to take care of. It can't really afford probably to drop cash and stock to buy something that also dilutes the ability to reward shareholders. That gets expensive on both ways or both directions, really. Hmm. So, you know, if I'm a Disney shareholder and I'm really happy with the performance of my company over the last three or five years, why do I want to invest a lot of money and time and executive attention into a company that I don't think is core to the business? I don't see it as a creative. I see it as a distraction. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think about, I mean, every time uh, something like this happens with Twitter, like everyone takes to Twitter to make fun of Twitter. It's like, you know, you going over to someone's house and using their telephone to call everyone and tell them that, you know, you don't like the person's house you're at. That's that's an awesome analogy. That's actually the best one I've heard yet. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I I think your point, though, is really fair. Twitter is awesome. So all this discussion about how Twitter is best leveraged, who should own it, how we should use it, Twitter itself is amazing. I mean, before this little segment, me and Megan were talking on Twitter, then via DM, and then now on Skype. But I mean, it's kind of the the natural platform for discussions of, of current events around the world still. And even though we joke about user growth and you know revenue growth and whatever, that's still true. The core Twitter experience, abuse problem aside, is incredible and very useful. So I think when we discuss you know, where it should fit, we can get a little caught up in the third screen stuff and the financials. But in reality, Twitter is still what I wake up to and what I go to sleep to. It's still the best thing online. Yeah. At least for me. It should be its tagline, Twitter, the best thing online. We should crowdfund to make, we should all crowdfund. Kickstarter. Kickstarter to buy Twitter. Oh, guys, that's, that's just, I mean, it is still worth $20 billion. I mean, like, I know we joke a little bit, but like <laughs> it's still worth a lot of money that us three put together times 10,000. So, right, but who's going to buy it? I mean, it has to be like, you know, I got this from Kurt Wagner, but he's, you know, a billionaire who just wants to buy it for fun, you know. So, so why does it have to sell? Why can't it just exist as an independent company? I mean, it's not growing very quickly right now, but it could theoretically turn that around. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the conclusion that it has to be sold is a bit of inside baseball on our side right. and kind of financial jujitsu. It could just keep on doing well. On an adjusted basis, it makes a lot of money once you reduce um, or take out share based compensation from its uh, financials. So Twitter, you know, generates cash. It's doing fine. Still growing. Um, did six hundred three million dollars in revenue last quarter. I mean, it's a big deal. I, I we should also keep that in mind. But at the same time, though, I really do prefer palace intrigue to a kind of classic performance. So I'll take it. It's yeah. funner for us. Yeah. It certainly gives us something to talk about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, Alex Wilhelm, Mattermark.com. Where can people follow you online on Twitter, let's say? Uh, I am Alex on Twitter, and uh, my backup account on Instagram is, as always, Megan Maroney. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> cool. Go to both places, follow, subscribe, whatever it is. Thank you, Alex, as always. It's a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Enjoy yeah. the debates. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> TNT's fan of the day is Sam Goddard on Twitter, who sent us this video of him riding his bicycle super, super, super fast. fast. And we should listen to it too. This is how I listen to Tech News Today. Yeah. <laughs> Don't wreck. Uh, oh, and it was shot on a verb, a Garmin verb. It's an action camera. It seemed like it would be so much easier for him to just put on those spectacles and... That's what I'm saying. (laughs) 10 seconds would be perfect. The perfect amount of time to do a How I Watch. And then, yeah, no flies in the eyes either. (laughs) That's true. While riding. So you're right. You don't need to look at his eyeballs while you're riding, while he's riding a bike, you know? Maybe you can convince me on the spectacles. All right. (laughs) Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video of yourself with with your spectacles or with whatever, uh, and then send it to Instagram, Google+, Twitter, Facebook. Use the hashtag How I Watch. TNT and we will find it. If you're using the spectacles, you'll have to send it to Snapchat, in which case we'll have to check Snapchat in order to find these. I know. Are I they know. on Snapchat? I don't know. It's just not a platform I look for how I watch is. I don't know. Um, I think maybe we have been sent one before, but I haven't opened Snapchat in a while. If, Sometimes, yeah, I'll just use the filters and then, yeah, and then put those on the other social about medias. But, and then yeah. moving along. Mm-hmm. Up next, a new California law aimed at curbing age discrimination in the movie industry is ruffling the feathers of free speech. But first, let's take a minute to thank ZipRecruiter. They are the sponsor of this episode. Perfect for if you're hiring or if you want to find the right candidate. Uh, for the job that you're posting. You don't know where to post it. That's what this is all about. Posting jobs in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you're going to need to post your job on all of the top job sites to make sure that you've cast the net wide enough. Uh, Now you can do that easily. With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to more than 100 job boards, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with one single 
click. Uh, just post one time, then you'll watch all of those candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. They make it really easy to manage to uh, you know check out your options. You can search by skills, location, work experience, and more. Lots of filters. Uh, ZipRecruiter's advanced matching technology delivers the most relevant candidates based on your specific criteria, allowing you to kind of drill down exactly where you need. ZipRecruiter offers optimized pages that look great on any screen. You can also add their unique mobile apply process for more visitors, more applicants, because that's what it's all about, getting as many as possible. Find candidates in any city or industry nationwide. You're not going to have to juggle emails or calls to your office, uh, and you can add multiple users to your account for managing that behind the scenes. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 1 million businesses and is trusted by hundreds of Fortune 500 companies. More than 125 million candidate applications have been delivered. So whether you're hiring now or if you plan on hiring in the near future, uh, check out their blog for recruiting tips and hiring resources. And then head on over to ZipRecruiter uh, right now. You can post your jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter is the fastest way to hire great people. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. On Saturday, Governor Jerry Brown signed a new law that requires internet entertainment databases like IMDb to remove an actor's age upon request. The law reads, quote, The purpose of this section is to ensure that information obtained on an internet website regarding an individual's age will not be used in furtherance of employment or age discrimination. So uh, there's, there's so many other ways to stop age discrimination. I don't know how this would work uh, with other kinds of discrimination, but I mean, I get it, I guess. Like if you are, I guess these places now are where uh, casting agents go right. and they say Talent like, look, I, I need, I need a, a girl for this production and that one's over 35, no thank you. I right. guess that's the way it works and you can have that removed, but this just seems silly. But again, I've never been as, I mean, as far as I know, targeted by age discrimination. I mean, I probably have, but I don't care. I'm happy with my job, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you can you can understand the sentiment behind it, obviously, because that would not be a great position to be in, right? To know you were perfectly qualified for something uh, and to know that, or to at least have, like, I don't know whether they feel like it's happening or whether they know exactly if and when it's happening, but to feel like that's happening, you know, to be singled out like that would not be very good. I just don't know how this fixes the problem. They say that it, it kind of sidesteps kind of, uh, you know, First Amendment rights uh, because it's only applying to commercial sites with display ads or payment for access. So, you know, that's that's uh, a positive, apparently. Uh, so it wouldn't be it wouldn't apply to news outlets or sites like Wikipedia. But I mean, isn't that kind of the, the point? Like anyone who's Anyone who's using these sites or using just the internet in general to, as part of the the process of selecting talent, like it's very easy to like search somewhere else. Just because it's not appearing in IMDb, does that mean that the 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 publicly available information is not available elsewhere, easily locatable for someone who that's really high priority for them to find? Well, I don't think it's uh, as easily locatable. I mean, like, you know, Amy Schumer's never going to be able to hide her age again. You know, neither is Taylor Swift or anyone like that. But maybe mm -hmm. if some, neither am I for that matter, because I have a Wikipedia page. It says I was born in 1973. You know, I'm never going to be able to put that toothpaste back in the tube. It's mm -hmm. out there and that's fine. Um, but I think maybe if you're just starting your career and you're young and you haven't gotten any jobs yet, um, you could start by, I, what they're talking about is the IMDB Pro accounts. Right. Um, so those are, that's what you do if you want to, that it's part of like, you know, it's your LinkedIn, but you're paying for it. Got so it. like, here's how I do it. Cause I want to get acting jobs or, um, I said, if you're young and starting out, which doesn't make sense because everybody wants someone young, <laughs> yes. but, uh, if right. But I mean, not all, not all actors or actresses who are starting out are young. Right. You know? Exactly. You might be starting out in your thirties and just say like, Hey, you know, I, I look younger and I want to get younger jobs and, you know, jobs for younger people. So, you know, what, what they say is like, it used to not be so easy to find someone. It was very difficult to find someone's age, you know, like 90210, they all lied about their age to get their jobs. Hmm. Um, and you just, there was no IMDB back then. And I, I get it, but it's just, it's when anyone tries to scrub the internet, 
um, for their own purposes. I, I don't like it, and it, I don't think it's going to work. And it's weird that it's a law. Yeah, I just it's think surprising it's that it weird. passed, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll see how effective it actually is. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be a part of the show by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW, and find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You can find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv. And if you want to go on Twitter and tweet at me and uh, <gasps> there tell we me. Are. There oh, we are. Oh, that was like first day. That was first episode, right? Well, first first for you and I anyways. I can't remember the episode number, but uh, we're like spring chickens. We are spring chickens back in the old <laughs> studio. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I didn't mean I, to I was you. so that was back that was like three years ago when I was twenty one. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. You can tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Brian. Thanks to Burke. Thanks to Kevin for editing, and thanks to you, whoever you are. I don't know your name because there's too many of you, but I'll just say you and point at you, even though I'm told I'm not supposed to do that. Sorry. Uh, we'll talk to you all tomorrow. Bye everyone. <laughs>